the uh, the premise of the talk is really about the approach to the book that I just took, and so I'm going to um, to explain that in just a minute. But before we begin, um, the QR code here should work to get to a Dropbox with the slides. Um, the link should also work, um, the tiny URL there, and it's been pasted into the chat room. So if you haven't um, grabbed that yet, please uh, feel free to. So um, <clears throat> the two other parts of my background that I would like to mention just briefly, because it does touch upon, I think, um, why WebAssembly interests me. And um, I, I mentioned it in, in the book as well, um, is I worked on the first whole earth visualization environment um, 25, 26, 27 years ago, something crazy like that, um, where we had terabytes of hyperspectral or uh, terrain information and hyperspectral imagery. And we were pulling you know, video frames off of predator drones and things like that. Um, and within a couple of years, we went from having everybody have to have uh, Silicon Graphics workstations to it runs on a PC with, with a GPU. And so that was one of the things that really sort of caught my attention with respect to um, the, the impact of hardware on, on software. And I'll mention that a little bit later as well. And then a couple of years later, I was the first employee at a company called Parabon. Um, and we were building an internet distributed computing company. So think SETI at home, like, except rather than sending data down to a fixed client, we sent down arbitrary Java applications um, and took advantage of idle time on, on computers all over the world. And so we did things like um, genetic-based algorithm feature selection for exhaustive regression searches and Monte Carlo-based digital rendering and gene sequence comparison things that would scale linearly. And that was sort of my first real taste at what does um, parallelization do to, to software as well. And those two things, um, surprisingly, actually, I think are, are going to be an interesting part of WebAssembly's future as well. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that, and then we'll, we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. So um, I've been speaking about WebAssembly since 2017. Um, obviously, that was way early <laughs> in terms of anybody actually being able to uh, adopt it. But um, I, I had been tracking it from the, the Google native client work and the portable native client work, the Pinnacle work, uh, with that morphing into ASM.js and then becoming sort of the, the community group and the working group. Um, and I really, I felt that this was going to be exciting. And that was even, you know, before WASI or any of the other things that, that I'm going to mention um, kind of came onto the scene as well. And so... Um, Several years later, I was having some conversations with Mike Lukides at um, O'Reilly, and I actually have a much bigger vision um, uh, about how all this stuff works together. And it's very complicated. So to sit down and, and explain it fully uh, takes a couple of hours at this point. And so I need to figure out the elevator pitch version of it. But um, I, I liken it a little bit to imagining going back in time and trying to explain to somebody when Iron Man came out, like what was coming with respect to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and, you know, I, I had a connection there too, because a friend of mine wrote Thor. And so I, I had an early taste for the, the fact that there was going to be more than one movie. But I mean, I had no clue that it was going to be as encompassing as it was. But what they did was they took known properties and started releasing them one at a time. And these, you know, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, they all had sort of followings and narratives that everybody was familiar with, and then started to tie them together into this much bigger arc around um, the cinematic universe and the Avenger movies. And so that's kind of where I'm finding myself now. Like WebAssembly is my Iron Man, and other ones include things like linked data and knowledge graphs, um, LLVM, hardware as, as a differentiating technology, um, architecture as a differentiating, differentiating approach, uh, resource-oriented thinking on top of all of this. And um, so I'm, I'm looking for, for ways to, to deal with this. And, and when, when I was explaining this to Mike, um, he, he was excited, but he was like, no idea how to turn that into a book. So why don't we just start with WebAssembly? And, and that kind of got the, the ball rolling. So um, 
you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to work on this during the, the pandemic. Um, and then it was released uh, back in December. Um, before anybody asks, because I, I know everyone's going to ask, um, I did get to choose the animal on the front. And as far as I know, I'm the only person in the history of O'Reilly publisher or authors who have been able to do so. Um, my inspiration was my, my own dogs. These, this is uh, Freya on the left and Loki on the right. They are Norwich Terriers. Uh, but I justified it in that the Norwich Terriers are um, the smallest working dog and that they are small, fast, and portable like, <laughs> like WebAssembly. So, I, I mean, I was kind of joking, but they ran with it, and uh, Karen Montgomery did a fantastic job, so much so that my dog's groomer wanted a copy of the book just because she loved the, the cover so much. So uh, that's the story of the cover. But the other thing that was kind of interesting about it is, you know, the, the pushback that I got, everyone was excited that this book was coming out, but there'd been several WebAssembly books at this point, really, really good ones. Um, Kevin Hoffman's Rust and WebAssembly book was one of the early ones that really sort of gave me a bigger vision of, of what was coming. Uh, Robert uh, Abu Khalil has a great uh, series of um, little tutorials and things that you can access through his leveling up uh I'll, I'll give you the link in, in a second when, when we talk about some examples. Um, so there's been a lot of great stuff out there, but because this is such a huge topic, they necessarily sort of focused on like C++ and WebAssembly or Rust and WebAssembly or WebAssembly for a particular purpose. And I had this much bigger vision based both on what I had seen from the WebAssembly community and kind of beyond. And that's, to me, what justified the use of the definitive guide brand because nobody else had had told that big story yet. Um, so I acknowledge the fact that it's a little premature and, and, and that uh, the technology needs to um, kind of prove itself in all of these. But I think as you'll see today that that is happening. And so what I want to do is I want to focus on the use cases that I see for WebAssembly um, and, and, and have that be the focus of the, the remainder of the talk. Um, feel free to pop in with questions if, if you have any. Otherwise, we'll try to leave some, some room at the end um, as, as well. All right. So um, one of the other early influences on, on my thinking was, was Lynn Clark and her fantastic cartoon introductions to WebAssembly. Um, and so if you do not follow her on Twitter or you do not read her blogs, please, please fix that because uh, she's one of my favorite technical communicators with how she tells stories. And this particular blog entry, which is now going on three and a half years old, um, highlights the evolution of the vision for, for, for WebAssembly quite nicely. To the extent that anybody knows anything about WebAssembly, this is their vision, right? It's, it's comprised by the, the core components of the minimum viable product, uh, which was necessarily, um, limited, right? It did not include threading support. It did not include exception handling. It did not include garbage collection. And these seem like really big things to leave out in in the you know time period in which this is happening. But it's because they wanted to focus on sort of like what was common to all of the languages and what runtimes did not uh, have onerous impact on the... Um, on the uh, the things that needed to be supported, right? So there, there always was the intent to support garbage collection and threading and these things. And there are proof of concepts that do all of those things. But um, the main idea was it is a compilation target, uh, not unlike the JVM's bytecode or .NET's CIL. Um, so there is a set of instructions. It is a stack-based machine abstraction and that's largely because they can ignore the underlying details of specific hardware, um, like the differences between, you know, a, a chip's uh, instruction set that was associated with a certain number of registers or other registers. Um, and then that can still then be easily compiled um, or optimized at runtime to a particular instruction set so that we had this combination of both portable and fast code. And then the uh, 
modules would be expressed as binary modules. So they would take up less space. They'd be easier to send across the network. They'd be easier to validate looking up integer indexes and things rather than strings. Um, and then using typed interfaces, which were originally added as part of WebGL to have an efficient communication mechanism between the JavaScript and the CPU and the um, data structures and things passed to and from uh, GPUs, um, we were able to emulate linear memory. And so when we talk about compiling C and C++ and running it um, in this environment, we are not actually talking about running C++ libraries in memory, uh, which would be a horrible and unsafe thing to do. Um, and what we've done is we've separated the instruction set from the, the data side of things. And so unlike in a typical C or C++ um, runtime, where the lack of array bounds checking and things like that allow you to do stack smashing uh, attacks and things like that, that's just not really possible in the same kind of way. So most of the early things that I'm going to show you momentarily um, are all based on this vision, which is the minimum viable product. It was supported by all the major vendors. Um, it got out the door in 2017. Um, and they kind of wanted to see what people did with it. And from there, um, <laughs> everything else happened. And everything else is this much larger story, which involves uh, improving the performance of JavaScript frameworks and supporting higher level languages like Erlang and Elixir and Java and things that require garbage collection. Uh, heavier weight desktop applications like Adobe Creative Suite, um, you know, uh, AutoCAD, um, things like that. Uh, parallelization, the idea of being able to do video editing in the browser. Um, Node has been a huge, huge um, part of WebAssembly from the beginning, in part because there has always been this need to write some low-level portion of your certain node applications in a language like C or C++ because JavaScript as an interpreter environment, no matter how good the, the V8 engines and, and SpiderMonkey and all that have gotten, um, it just can't be ahead of time optimized. And so there would, was this idea that you would occasionally have to rely on native code and that's great. And JavaScript and these libraries would work well, but we've just given up portability. And now the node environment has to worry about, you know, you're installing a node application on a Linux box versus a Windows box and these native libraries, which is kind of a pain. So having the ability to eliminate all that pain and yet still have a, an efficient expression of native code in something other than JavaScript, where the dependency could be on a portable fast version of something as opposed to particular native libraries, that's been a big part of, of the story as well. But finally, there's, there's this idea that our computational landscape has exploded in so many different uh, dimensions, different chipsets, different architectures, uh, different runtime profiles. Um, there's this hardware element to what's happening in our industry that I think WebAssembly is going to have a big story to tell as, as well. So I'm going to cover basically all of this, but we're going to start with um, the, the more traditional uh, use cases that um, the MVP unlocks. So the first one um, is the idea that WebAssembly can be used as a mechanism for code reuse. Uh, a lot of people think WebAssembly is designed to kill JavaScript, and it is simply not the case. Uh, there are a lot of, I mean, Brendan Eich was part of the early uh, plans with, with WebAssembly. The idea is it just gives us some alternatives, right? So right now, uh, particularly when you're targeting the browser, but you know, also if you're targeting a, a node-based backend or something like that as well, um, we have this scenario where a lot of code exists, but in order to share it in these runtime environments because of limitations and language choice and everything, um, JavaScript's really the only choice. So as a simple example of how WebAssembly might be useful, um, there's this command line tool called JQ. Many of you have probably used it. Um, it's, it's very portable code. It's written in C, uh, but it allows you to interact with JSON 
um, usually as part of some kind of REST API or messaging system. Um, this is an example that I, I grabbed from uh, a proof of concept that Craig Walls did for using JWT's J, uh, JSON Web Tokens to interact with uh, OAuth services in Spring Boot. So the idea is your command line tool could interact with a, an authorization server, uh, get back some JSON that has an access token embedded in it, pipe the results into JQ, and then through this little query language, strip off the particular element, in this case, the access token itself, and assign it to an environment variable so that subsequent requests could simply pass that in as the bearer token um, and you wouldn't have to like copy and paste really long, obnoxious, opaque uh, OAuth tokens anymore. But you know, people do it to like hit a hit an endpoint and get back a list of email addresses and um, names, and then generating contact lists for uh, new new accounts. Welcome to our welcome to our platform or whatever that kind of stuff. So it's it's nice, well uh, well written, clean, portable C code. But because it doesn't run in the browser, um, you would have to rewrite that code in, in JavaScript. And there's certainly nothing about JavaScript that would keep that from happening. It's just kind of annoying, right? Why would we? Why do we have to rewrite everything in JavaScript if we don't have to? So this this one first use case is the idea that the code can can be made portable and we can use it. And that's part of, to me, one of the longer arc stories and benefits of WebAssembly, which is that organizations will be able to capture value for longer. And you're not going to have to throw stuff away and rewrite stuff all the time just because developers chase shiny objects and new programming languages and, and things like that. You're going to be able to write code and you're going to be able to use it um, in a wide wider range of options than you perhaps have been in the past. And that will be cost savings. It'll be, you know, uh, stable code. Um, so that's that's an, a nice use case. But as you'll notice, these use cases are not mutually exclusive and they often overlap and, and tie together. Um, the This is something I, that I just came across recently. Um, Fermion's coming up with a nice summary that they're, they're tracking in terms of um, browser use case, or sorry, language support in, in uh, for, for WebAssembly. And obviously the ones that everybody knows about, C++, um, C, uh, Rust, uh, are, are part of the story. But one of the other things that I wanted to focus on in my book is how that's changing. So I have a chapter on assembly script. I have a chapter on .NET integrations. I have a chapter on emerging languages like Grain and Zig. Um, less well-supported languages like Ruby and um, Swift and Go, but they're, you know, that that support is coming and it's coming quickly. So while right now the perspective may be like C, C++, and Rust code can be reused um, without having to rewrite everything, uh, that's going to change very quickly uh, in terms of what other languages are, are supported. So um, that was also part of the complication of writing the book. When O'Reilly first asked me who the audience was, I thought, well, I think it's like three different audiences. There's, you know, C++ people who have not been relevant on the web for quite some time. Um, I mean, very relevant in other scenarios, but not the web. Uh, suddenly have a way of reusing their code. Uh, there's going to be JavaScript developers who have done nothing but do JavaScript, right? And they will never, maybe have never dealt with a compiler before. So the idea of ahead of time optimization and these sorts of things are going to be very new to them. And then there's going to be sort of like polyglot sort of, you know, people who are, are fluid and, and move from different environments and whatnot and want to tie it all together. So that was really the big challenge for the book um, was to how to address all of those audiences from all of those backgrounds um, and not annoy anybody or lose anybody along the way. And um, it was it was tricky to try to get the ordering uh, out the way that I did. Um, but thankfully, um, the feedback so far is it, it seems to be working um, because it would have been possible to like write a good book that was useless to people if, you know, I only want to do JavaScript with it or I only want to do um, Rust or something like that. So um, I, I spent a lot of time stressing about whether this was going to work or not. But um, 
thankfully so far uh, the, the feedback is um, has been positive on that front. So our next use case is uh, really more about extending the universal client. And obviously that's primarily in our vision, um, a browser. But if we go back to Dr. Fielding's thesis, um, one which coincidentally was not about rest. <laughs> a lot of people think um, it was, rest is only chapter five. The, the purpose of Dr. Fielding's thesis is to talk about architectural styles as a collected set of constraints designed to elicit certain properties um, out of the architecture. So the web works in part because of all the standardization and the support for layering and um, horizontal messaging on vertical services and all that kind of stuff. But because we can extend the client by sending code down to it, we have um, the ability to to push things down without having to require any kind of installation. And that's a huge cost savings for companies and organizations and whatnot. But as an accident of history, for 30 years, that has also only meant JavaScript unless we had some kind of plugin environment. And so that's the race that we've had from day one is how do we have safe, fast, portable code? And we've tried it with things like ActiveX, which would be fast, but neither safe nor portable. Um, Java and applets, which um, wouldn't be all that fast. They would be sort of safe, but you notice nobody has Java applet support in their browsers anymore. Um, Flash had a good run, but the problem with all of these is they were not part of the web. They were segmented off from the web. They couldn't interact with the DOM. They couldn't take advantage of everything else that we were doing in that part of the, the, the standardization process. And so they were always just kind of like Franken apps, right? The, the user interface in Flash looked nothing like uh, any of the web application uh, part of it. And so one of the choices that you know the WebAssembly team really seemed to have made was let's not reinvent things that we don't need to reinvent. And let's not overcomplicate the platform and let's not require too much of it um, so that it does gain the ability to have access to these different uh, deployment environments because we're not over-specifying things. And I think that's one of the mistakes that Sun made with, with Java was to say, right, oh, now we have to reinvent a UI layer. Oh, now we have to reinvent a uh, communication or networking layer. Or now we have to do this other sort of stuff. Whereas the approach with WebAssembly has basically been, we will make the code portable, and then we will figure out how to expose capabilities to that runtime um, in these different environments. And by the way, that also includes the runtime does not directly have support to read from the file system or to open up network connections. And so that's in part where we gain a huge leap forward with our security posture as well. So taking the JQ example uh, as, as a starting point, uh, Robert Abu, Abu Khalil, um, here's a link I will paste into the chat room uh, for his content, which is, is quite good. Um, levelupwasm.com, there we go. He has, a, as a proof of concept, this JQ Kung Fu platform, which is basically JQ recompiled to WebAssembly so that it is available to run in the browser. Even though JavaScript certainly could have been used to provide the same behavior, there wasn't a need to. So we can have this JSON here on the left. We can select, in this case, the first element. But just by making it interactive, we can say, you know, grab me the email address from all of the elements. And that behavior is, is available. It's easy to tie into the, um, the, the web environment, right? It looks very natural. We've gotten really good at building nice looking portable user interfaces and things through the standards. Um, and so in this case, you know, it's just a lightweight way of having some capability be shared and runnable in, in this environment um, in a nice way. So when code reuse plus extending the universal client use cases combine, we have this kind of uh, opportunity with respect to, to the WebAssembly platform. Now, of course, you know, if we can do one command line tool, we could probably do other command line tools. 
and obviously one of the most powerful command line tools is a C compiler. So this is now the Klein compiler compiled to WebAssembly to run in the browser. So we could take other C and C++ code in the browser and compile it to WebAssembly. So in this case, to a six kilobyte module that we can then take and run within the capabilities of, of the browser. Now this works because the tool chain has support for mapping things like OpenGL calls to WebGL calls and you know whatever other kinds of things that you need to capabilities that the browser supports. But the fact that we compiled the C compiler to WebAssembly to run in the browser to compile other C code to WebAssembly to run in the browser um, is a stack of uh, turtles in there somewhere. So here's some other code. Uh, has a dependency on a third-party library. Um, it will pull that library in, and then once it's um, compiled, we have an 18K module, which is then able to reach out and fetch things by relying on the browser's ability to fetch network connections and uh, see these things um, come through. Now, keep in mind for some of these demos, um, it's going to come across as a little choppy but that's just because of the, the video sharing um, in person. If you go and check out any of these things, uh, you should see very fluid kinds of interactions. So, I mean, obviously that's that gives us I, ideas about tool chains of the future, development environments of the future. Um, you look at what GitHub is doing, you know, you right click on, on a, a, a file or whatever the, the UI thing is, and you can open up Visual Studio code or something to interact with the code and to then be able to check it back in, right? So we're getting away from this world where we're gonna have to install all these tool chains locally. Um, and something like Chrome OS starts to look a little bit more appealing as a lightweight, low overhead, um, thin operating system layer um, the, uh, with the abilities of a desktop environment. Now this is not going to work for you, and it'll probably look a little bit uh, janky just because of uh, the uh, the video. But again, I'm serving this up locally, and it's the Unity engine uh, and a demo called Epic Zen Garden. You've probably seen it before. Apple used it as the showcase of their hardware three or four years ago, um, and what was back then um, a way of of showing off Apple hardware now works completely seamlessly in the browser. I'm running it on Mac OS um, and Firefox, but it'll work with Chrome on Linux. It'll work with uh, Edge on, on Windows. And again, in when you run it, well, actually you can't run it, sorry. <laughs> um, if you could run it, um, you, there's sound and it's, it's very smooth. The reason you can't run it is because it was based on an older version of things. Uh, and I happened to grab it at you know when it was available, and I just don't think they're making it available uh, anymore um, because technically things have changed, but it's still a good example of of what is possible. So um, we're going to have you know tools to allow us to expo explore explore uh, 3D immersive environments. Uh, I'm not going to use the M word. Uh, they didn't they didn't invent it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to use their terminology. Um, but you know, having standard-based 3D immersive environments that people can interact with, um, and only having to build them once, is is going to be amazing. So in this case, uh, not that M word, the shorter one, uh, four letters. Um, the idea here is we're going to be able to interact with, uh, but but you know, a, a Minecraft-like environment would, would obviously be uh, quite easy to to do here as well, um, and you only have to build it once. And you don't have to build it in a lowest common denominator approach. So as long as something like the engine, the um, the Unity engine can um, run in these these cases, then um, we're we're in good shape. Now, my favorite example uh, of this, um, some of you have probably seen this, is showing off what I think the future of the web looks like, and it's really just this polyglot environment that takes advantage of what the browser has to offer. So Colin Eberhardt put together a Sudoku solver that uses WebRTC to gain permission to access to the video camera. Uh, he holds up an unsolved Sudoku game, 
He uses OpenCV to rotate the, the, the board until it's flat. He uses TensorFlow to do the recognition of the numbers. He then uses a Rust Sudoku solver to solve the numbers that were given to him, uh, and then projects the results going back the other way with OpenCV on the uh, unsolved um, puzzle. So augmented reality, being able to interact through sensor devices and cameras and things like that, um, but the ability to take and reuse existing libraries and code um, and just kind of tie it all together. That's to me, the one of the more compelling visions of what the future of the, the web looks like for us. Um, this also is not going to work for you, but if you're interested uh, in this, um, let me know and I'll, I'll send you a link. I, I just don't have it off the top of my head. But this is from an old Google um, I.O. tutorial that they had. This is a hosted SVG image. Now this image is, um, so the, 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 obviously the hourglass is the image. Um, and we see the sand particles falling down through the center of the image. But what's interesting about this is SVG has, this SVG has embedded JavaScript in it. And that JavaScript is setting up an animation sequence and the animation sequence is firing, you know, once a second or whatever. Um, to determine where the sand particles should go and um, what, um, and then, you know, updating the, the scene. The fascinating part is it is a physics engine called Chipmunk, written in C, compiled to WebAssembly, being called from JavaScript, launched from an SVG image that is making this choice. And that these sand particles are not just random pixels on a canvas, they are DOM elements. So they are DOM elements being positioned by a C++ physics engine from JavaScript in an SVG image, which of course we can animate and flip gravity and uh, have it go the other way. So again, that's another example of mixing what the web already has the ability to do um, with the ability to extend it. Because without this ability, you have to go convince 400 companies that this is worth doing, right? That's what the web standardization process looks like through the W3C. It's a member organization, um, probably you know dominated by Google and Apple and some other heavy players, but it is still a member organization that before anybody works on anything, they have to agree that it's worth the time to do so. Now you've got the ability to extend the browser in ways that JavaScript is not good at for low level bit fiddly kinds of details that can't be optimized ahead of time. Um, and we don't have to wait for the standardization process to, to go. Now I'm, I'm a huge fan of standards. So I'm not saying that in a negative way, it's just the world moves too fast for us to wait for 400 organizations to agree on what to do. Now, again, I said, one of my background jobs that I wanted to talk about was um, the whole earth visualization environment that we worked on called Edge. Some of our people left and went to go work at another company and that company was bought by Google um, and that became Google Earth. And so what in my professional career used to involve computers, desktop computers that were like 10,000, 20,000, $30,000 to run has basically now been ported to the point where it can run in a browser in a cross-platform way, but it can also take advantage of the features of the browser. So here we have Google Earth running, right, in the browser, but it also can take advantage of the fact that we can reach out and click on something and go fetch content from Wikipedia, like images and descriptions and whatnot. So having this immersive three-dimensional environment where we can zoom around and have the performance um, that, like I said, in my professional career, used to recall or used to call uh, or cost tens of thousands of dollars, is now done in a browser in a cross-platform way, uh, is is really quite uh, quite phenomenal. So that is the Google Earth compiled to to WebAssembly. So there's a lot more that we could be do we could be doing by extending the browser, but moving from Lynn's first image to Lynn's second image, um, one of the next big things to, to move forward uh, with is um, 
extending the server. Now, as I said, Node has had support for Web WebAssembly all along, so I'm not focusing on that. But one of the things that I would like to introduce is the fact that Dino, which is Ryan Dahl's uh, Node 2.0, <laughs> Node with security, um, and I think a huge um, candidate for server-side development in the future, um, comes with built-in support for WebAssembly. So when you're um, building a node-based application, you can use TypeScript. Um, it still gets transpiled to JavaScript behind the scenes, but the experience is almost like it supports it natively and doesn't have to do that. Um, and so you get the benefit of type-safe systems and generics, but you also get the portability of having low-level optimized code compiled to WebAssembly and interacting with these uh, low-level modules is literally a question of reaching out and fetching these things over the web. Now, keep in mind that involves it could involve caching the results. So it's like we have the ability to have zero installation, even though we are sort of downloading native things. But we don't have to worry about security in the same way we do with typical desktop applications. Nor do we have to worry about security in the way that we have to do with Node itself, because supply chain attacks are becoming a real problem. Uh, and so when you have an environment that does not have security built in natively, then whatever privileges and permissions that are afforded the user running the application are given to the code that runs. And that way, code provenance and everything becomes so much more important. But if we have safe, fast, portable, sandboxed systems, that, that is a game changer. So this use case is really just about um, being able to run WebAssembly on the server. And that's true for Node. That's true for, for Dino. But doing so in a sandboxed environment is the other part of the game-changing aspect of this. So here, we're relying on the capabilities of WASI. If you're not familiar with WASI, WASI stands for the WebAssembly Systems Interface. WebAssembly makes your code portable. WASI makes your applications portable. <coughs> code that runs in a browser, because browsers have support for fetching things with the Fetch API or using WebGL and things like that, are not available in these backend servers. So one of the other things Dino is trying to do is to, to provide more of the web IDL interfaces like Fetch um, and the window um, global window object and things like that um, in, in that environment. So code is more portable. WASI is taking that to the next level. So if you're familiar with POSIX, the portable operating system um, library, you write against an API, and then the API is implemented using native uh, functionality like Linux kernel uh, interrupts or Win32 capabilities. But your application is portable because all you need is a library to link against. That's, in essence, what, what WASI is doing for us. And then we have WASI environments. So here we have a very simple Rust application that prints out Hello World. I can install a WASI-aware backend to Rust. So here's, here's where Iron Man meets Thor, right? LLVM as a um, multi-stage com compilation architecture allows you to change your backend. So rather than targeting your native application uh, operating system or WebAssembly generically, you could target a WASI WebAssembly environment that says, I will give you access to anything that you need with respect to these interfaces. And while these interfaces are going to be um, initially targeting things like file access and things like that, you'll see environments like uh, WASM Edge and others are providing um, working examples of WASI-like capabilities for threading and networking and, and things like that. So as long as you run in an environment that provides the application uh, interfaces that you need, not only does your code become portable, your application becomes portable. And I fully expect we will see WASI uh, interfaces for 3D graphics and cryptocurrency, smart contracts, and crypto crypto cryptography, which is crypto stands for cryptography, by the way. Um, but in this case, all I'm doing is changing my backend environment for the Rust engine, which is LLVM based. And I can have a, a, a runtime like Wasm time or Wasmer or any of the other uh, WASI aware engines out there. 
And I could just simply say, take my compiled output and run it. And one of the things it will provide is access to print to the console in this particular case. That's not something WebAssembly can do on its own. The historical way of doing that by providing a function through the import object in, in WebAssembly is not going to scale. Um, so we're trying to solve the need for portable APIs. But WasmTime also allows you to define capabilities-based security systems where you have to provide in a non-fungible um, token, not, not a NFT, but like a an opaque um, resource given to you by a trusted authority like the operating system as evidence of what you're allowed to do to solve the confused deputy problem, which is largely what the um, supply chain attacks are taking uh, advantage of um, in the typical sort of permission-based um, security environments. So now a different environment like Wasmer, which is uh, providing uh, support for languages and platforms and whatnot, go grab that, download it, run it. And it's a different environment. It's a different code base. It's got a different um, provenance, but it's got the same kind of capability um, because it provides the same WASI interfaces. But notice you can also imagine having things like the Lua environment compiled to WebAssembly and, and um, WASI or SQLite. And again, as long as you have the ability to provide what it needs, then these applications become portable in pretty phenomenal ways as, as well. Now, the, the WASMR group put, put out this thing called WAPM. It is to WebAssembly what NPM is for, for Node. And you could go see that this is now a mechanism for people to be able to publish um, their their environments, right? So a Unix-like reverse engineering framework or um, a program for making large letters out of ordinary text. And so people can write this using pretty much whatever language they want, publish it to WAPM, and then be able to install them like a regular package management system. So you could say WAPM install Cowsay, WAPM install JavaScript. So where we started running WebAssembly in a JavaScript environment, we're now running JavaScript in a WebAssembly environment. Like I said, there's a lot of turtles in there, but it works and it's pretty cool. So I'm not going to go through this uh, just in the interest of time, I'm, but there's a demo from the Wasm Time package that allows you to basically um, take a C++ file or a Rust file from this link here. Uh, in this case, I've got the instructions for the Rust one. Just drop the Rust one in place run it or build it, and it'll build it for your native application, your native operating system. And then it'll allow you to copy an input file to an output file. So as the owner of the machine, I have permission you know, to, to move stuff around. So I can say, here's a file, copy it from here to someplace else, and it'll work. But if I take the same code, recompile it with a WASI backend, not the native desktop application backend, it now loses the ability to hit the file system unless I give it that ability. And so when I try to run it, it's like, nope, you you do not have any um, credentials that say you're allowed to, to open that, so I'm not gonna allow you to. And yet, if I run it in a way that tells the WASMR environment, well, give it access to this directory or that directory, then it's able to work. So now you see that the, the, the full vision is, not only do we get application portability out of this, we get to control what functionality you have available to you. And so Wasmer can do this, WasmTime can do this, any of the other WASI aware environments can do this as well and put permission models in, in this as well. Yes, uh, Daniel. Hi, um, is this kind of what people are talking about when they think of WebAssembly as possibly replacing Docker in some cases? Basically, Solomon Hike, uh, Hikes, or whatever, I'm sorry, I don't know his last name, um, is on record as saying, if WebAssembly and WASI had existed, there would be no, no Docker. Now, it's not a complete or thought, I mean, they're not completely isomorphic capabilities, um, but I think we will rely on, on those sorts of containers less and less over time, the more we have support for here. For the time being, there's no, there's no reason they can't work together. Um, right. And a lot of the... Des a lot of the demos and things that people run uh, are Docker based, um, but I think the permission model and the the security model of WebAssembly and WASI is stronger than than Docker's is 
uh, natively. Um, so I, I think I, I think people will move in this direction. But yes, absolutely, that's that's where that's coming from. Yeah, it seems kind of cool because I mean, I guess Docker was big because you know there's so much. Containers are so much smaller than you know virtual machines, but this is even smaller. So that's just hold that thought. <laughs> hold that. Hold that thought. <laughs> because we're going even smaller. So, um, Wazi also supports the concept of polyfills, right? So you now have the ability to run code that doesn't really care about where and how it's running, right? If I need access to the file system. You can give me an API that pretends like it's giving you access to the file system. If you're running in a browser, that might be to write to local storage. But the application does not have to be modified in order to do so. But there are also polyfills that allow this stuff to work in, an, in environments that don't actually support WebAssembly, which is really mind-blowing. Uh, it doesn't work well, so don't, don't get too excited. But the idea is that the applications are gaining real portability, not just language and OS portability, but runtime portability as well as being more secure. So you'll write your applications to libraries and those libraries will happen um, in an environment and that environment will provide the capabilities or not. And therefore we can have hosted in, in applications, we can have native applications, we could have bare metal um, data center kinds of things, you could have stuff running in browsers. And it's just, it's not going to matter um, when and how the stuff runs. This is so important that there's now an organization called the Bytecode Alliance uh, that is pushing forward to standardize on secure new software foundations built around WebAssembly and WASI. And who is involved with that? Well, you know, Amazon, ARM, Fastly, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Siemens. So this is... This has got legs. This is moving forward. Yes, Jeff. How does this, that Bytecode Alliance not turn into the new 400 or person um, that you have to convince to do new things? It's a good question. I think it's orthogonal to the conversation. I'm happy to have that conversation with you offline. Just kind of like, is, is there a technological thing that's going to give us a, a, a leg up on this that didn't um, have space? Uh, let me let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got some ideas. I just I don't want to ramble right now, or ramble on different topics. <laughs> All right. So the next um, use case is the idea of an optimizing engine. So I talked about this a little bit already. Um, several of the JavaScript frameworks have rewritten parts of themselves in WebAssembly to optimize portions of themselves that never did all that well from a performance perspective. Um, in JavaScript. So in this case, um, TensorFlow.js, when it was originally deployed, has a low-level API, um, a layers API based on Keras on top of it. In the browser, it has a pluggable backend that allows you to plug in uh, WebGL. Uh, but in a node environment, you could have a version that talks to vectorizing CPUs, uh, GPUs, tensor processing units, et cetera. And now the same application, again, is written against stable APIs. This is kind of like WASI. It's not exactly the same thing. This is a particular software architecture that, that does this. But look at the impact that hardware has here. So this is you know, Iron Man, Thor. Now we're talking about the Hulk, I guess. Um, this, the application running an environment that just has a CPU and JavaScript support, this is for like a facial recognition uh, task or something takes about 3,300 milliseconds. The same application running in a browser with mediocre graphics can run in 49 milliseconds on a beefy desktop with, uh, at this year, several year old uh, GPUs, you can get it down to five milliseconds. On the server, again, running in a different environment um, without hardware acceleration, but vectorizing CPU instruction sets, can get it down to 87 milliseconds, and in an environment like Node, uh, Node with CUDA, could get down a thousand times faster um, with um, that environment. But the application itself doesn't change. Uh, I saw a hand. Sorry, I didn't see who it was. It might have just been me. I think um, someone said, "Wow." Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> now, so they go to all this trouble, um, and they make this available. 
But then what they do is they create a WebAssembly plugin or backend. Now, hopefully, given the first use case, you realize that didn't mean starting from scratch. They took a C++ based neural network environment and compiled it to WebAssembly, exposed it to support the APIs. And then we now see that the WebAssembly environments in blue compare favorably, favor, favorably performance-wise to the WebGL implementation across a wide range of hardware, from iPhones to Android phones to desktop Linux to MacBook Pros, et cetera, as compared to like the plain JavaScript version. And there are cases, depending on the model, there's a built-in latency between uh, code sending stuff down to the GPU and like a waiting for asynchronous stuff to come back, where certain models will do better with the WebAssembly version than the GPU hardware uh, one. Now, WebAssembly will have support for SIMD uh, parallelization. Uh, it's already got a standard that's that's basically defined. But the point here is they were able to take the same application and make it work well across a wider hardware base. So devices that had decent CPUs but no graphics support could now benefit from WebAssembly in that environment. And once WebAssembly gets access through things like WebGPU and other sorts of things, this will get even more uh, uh, impact, impactful. Um, Dan, do I have a hard stop at, at, in, in six minutes, or can I just spill over a little bit longer? Nope. Yep. Keep on going as long as you like. OK. Um, so the next case is as a plugin engine. So you have an application framework, and you want to ex extend it. So um, one of the ones that a lot of people know about is the fact that Envoy allows you to extend it, like create custom filters, to create custom um, capabilities, right? Um, so for networking code and being able to deploy arbitrary filters, um, they can be very fast, portable. You can target you know, Envoy running in these different environments. And there's just no need to care or worry about operating system differences. So being able to, to have filters and things like that plugged in um, is, is pretty wild. But one that kind of surprised me, given the fact that it had already been deployed and was the situation, was Microsoft's Flight Simulator now supports WebAssembly-based plugins, not C++ DLLs anymore, um, because they want to support both security and portability. So again, think about what it means to extend your platform with a plugin capability. If the plugins can be written in a high-performance language and compiled to this intermediate representation and possibly be sandboxed, um, that's a pretty compelling you know, combination of capabilities. So, that's another use case that I expect to see much, much more widely uh, adopted. And it's it's actually way more than what I'm highlighting here, but just those are two prominent ones. Um, many of you have probably done some work with data science and machine learning, um, and you probably use Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks requires a backend server, and then the code is sort of pulled out of the text elements in the, the documents. and um, sent to the backend server where they're executed, then the results are coming back. But that's because Python doesn't run in the browser, right? Or does it? Pyodide is a project that is spun off of Mozilla. It doesn't fall within their current, like, holy crap, we need to make money now <laughs> uh, realities. But it's it's tremendous work. So we have the notebooks here on, on, the, on the left, uh, and we have the cells, and the cells are like, documentation. But notice this one on line 12, I'm going to execute now, is going to trigger the loading of the Python environment. So just like the Unity engine was compiled to WebAssembly to run anything that runs on top of Unity, just like Lua can be combined, compiled to WebAssembly, so anything that runs on top of that can, can run there, um, the Cython, the C engine for Python, has been compiled to WebAssembly. And now the Python environment runs on top of that. So now I can do things like um, you know, deal with Python lists and dictionaries and whatnot. Um, and I don't need a separate backend server anymore to have this stuff um, go and communicate with. It can be done directly in the browser. And notice this change me element right here 
and this code over here, we now have the ability through this interaction to have the DOM being changed by languages other than JavaScript. Uh, currently, WebAssembly code can call into JavaScript, which can call um, there, but we have these more natural ways of hooking JavaScript to these languages like Python, so that from Python, we can actually imagine changing the um, DOM elements as well. But this is really part of a larger vision of sort of, again, interactive textbooks and literate programming and all these things that um, we've talked about. And notice because it can be embedded directly within the environment, we don't have this weird, this is DOM and this is plugin kind of nonsense. So here, you know, kids can kind of get in and, and you know, zoom around. And rather than having sort of static images in textbooks, you can have uh, interactive um, environments. So the uh, Iodide project and Pyodide in particular, I think, are, are pretty compelling ways of thinking about um, the notebook structure, which is useful for telling data stories, um, but doing so in a way that is less artificial and doesn't require separate infrastructure in the form of a backend server. You can just run it directly in the browser. Then there's the whole idea of embedded systems, right? Java is great, but the, the one way to think about WebAssembly is the promise of Java with 30 years of experience, right? We were promised Java would be running on all these different things, but because of the heavy overhead cost, um, the runtime with garbage collection and things like that, it's just not the case. So we have um, things emerging like Graal VM and Spring Native, and people are generating stuff from Java. But you know, at that point, you're giving up um, some of what it means to, to be a Java programmer at, in, in that environment. Um, so it may be working a little too hard, in, in my opinion. I, I've got nothing against Graal VM. I think it's, it's cool. But um, it, and you can call WebAssembly code from there, just like you can. Uh, anything else, but having microcontrollers and small devices and things like that is, is super crucial. And so that's where runtimes like Wasm 3 and uh, again, um, Wasm Edge and some of the other the ones that we're gonna talk about in a minute, um, have the ability to target into these lower profile runtime environments. So with internet of things, devices and sensors, um, being able to target these is is remarkable. So Wasm3 is, is, a, is a small WASI aware runtime written in C. Um, and somewhere along here, we've got the uh, supported hardware and it includes things like, you know, Adafruit and Raspberry Pi Picos and Spark Fun things. So now code can be taken and uh, compiled down to and run in these different environments as well uh, with the WASI environment um you know the capabilities that you need will be provided the bytecode alliance has support for uh wasm r um which is a an embedded runtime for these things um so we're again we're we're seeing the same code be able to target a much smaller um environment than i think is even going to be possible with things like native uh java images and um graal vm then there's the idea of using WebAssembly as a strategy for your development environment that allows you to build interactive user experiences that run either in the browser or out of the browser. And that's a different use case, but um, we're starting to see it pan out. In doing research for the book, one of the things that I really was kind of surprised by is how advanced some of these things are. So eGUI is an immediate mode UI library written for allowing people to, to write reusable cross-platform code in games. But um, the idea is you also may want it to run as a standalone application. So you can download eGUI and you can compile it and run it as like a Mac OS application, but the exact same application has a pluggable backend like the TensorFlow.js environment that has the ability to run in the browser as well. So this is like a little demo um, and it's obviously, you know, kind of information overload, but we've got like all the little widgets and the drop down menus and the, the dialogues and 
the ability to plot graphics and you know edit code environments um, and and whatnot. And again, this exact same application recompiles and runs as a native application as well. It's got different UI backends. This one is backed by a WebGL based implementation. But the idea now is you can write your application and say, some of our customers want to run it as a native Windows application. Some of us, some of them want to run it as a zero installation in the browser application. And there will be very little that you will have to do to target both environments. Yep. I just had a question about that. So are they using WASI um, on the back end for that, for the different system interfaces? Um, I, there may be a little bit of WASI here, but he created his own indirection layer. I see. So okay. he has a set of capabilities that he has a back end implementation that speaks um, you know, WebGL and one that speaks OpenGL and it will, it basically, you're just targeting one one of those implementations. Got it. Got but it. that's exactly the kind of thing that Wazi will also provide. Yep. Yeah, it looks like we see kind of WebAssembly and Rust kind of living alongside each other a lot of the time. Is that mm -hmm. more of just a historical accident just because they both came out of Mozilla? Or is there some technical reason why like they're There's... more closely related to one another? The answer is all of the above, right? So yes, they both came out of Mozilla, um, but Rust is LLVM based. So in essence, all LLVM or all Rust had to do was to add a WebAssembly backend, and rather than targeting the instruction set of Linux on x86 or you know uh, Apple x86 or something, um, you could target code that does not require file system access and network and things like that um, as WebAssembly instructions. So Rust was one of the first ones that had the ability to natively emit WebAssembly, whereas um, Clang itself um, didn't have support because LLVM itself didn't have support without like installing some pluggable backends. So in the Inscript and tool chain, which came to us by way of ASM.js and um, basically the people who created WebAssembly, um gave you an environment that that hid all those details um but eventually llvm and clang got the, that support directly as as well so that's one part of the story is is it was it was much easier to to um for the rust team just to say hey we want to do this um the clang team could have said that but didn't uh at least not initially and they waited for it to be added more formally to llvm itself but um the other part of the story is that, um, you know, uh, Rust, um, so there's there's the, they both come from the same organization. They both come from, or, you know, the, uh, it's LLVM, LLVM based, but L Rust has always supported um, through LLVM cross-platform, cross-compilation kinds of things. So it's just, it's sort of a natural fit. And then that becomes you know another one of the avengers as a language rust materially moves the security ball down the road down the field while at the same time maintaining security or performance so we now have the ability to move runtime security errors to compile time errors which is a nice capability to bring on top of a completely portable sandbox environment so there's a natural security kind of synergy there as as well Thank you. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, many of you probably heard about this recently, but uh, eGUI e is not the only thing that runs in the browser. This may take a second, and I'm not going to wait too long. But I thought it cached some of the results. In any case, LibreOffice uh, now now runs natively in the browser. Um, because Qt and all of the libraries that it's based on have long been associated with ASM.js and WebAssembly. So again, these environments allow you to write something very sophisticated like a Office suite, and then just simply retarget it, run natively on the application, run natively, or run or, you know the same application in the browser. Um, I'm guessing it's this, this is 
going to take too long, but uh, you've got the link. It it works, um, and it's uh, it's pretty impressive. And you know, Microsoft is very interested in in this. Apple is very interested in stuff like this because again, Office. 365 is not one-to-one feature comparable. It doesn't work exactly the same way as um, the the desktop applications. And so, again, being able to just have this as part of your development strategy, I think, is is going to be a, a game changer for many organizations. But then there's the other side of this, which is it's not part of your development strategy. You're not exposing WebAssembly structures. You're not making anybody really care about WebAssembly. Um, it's just an implementation detail. And that is what things like Blazor do. So Blazor is Microsoft's new newest way of targeting um, native ASP net web kinds of applications using C Sharp and um, a kind of funky C Sharp XML kind of hybrid language. Um, but it allows you to write code that is cross-platform and portable and secure and doesn't require installation. And if we look at the network view and reload this, you'll see a bunch of DLLs. So why is this working? This is working because the mono platform or a subset of the mono platform has been compiled to WebAssembly and is available as a large runtime. Now, Blazor also works with server side um, content and communicates over Signal R to purely JavaScript based um, stuff. But it's the, this is the trade off that it gives you. You can either have a very quick download where you ha may have some built in latency or you can push the entire application to run in the browser, but it has this dependency on the .NET runtime. And this is something that I think a lot of JavaScript developers are not gonna like. And I say that because I think once the uh, bosses in enterprise environments realize that they can have C-sharp based ap applications basically running in browsers in cross-platform ways in safe sandbox ways with zero installation those are a lot cheaper to build than going out and finding a bunch of javascript developers who can do it well right javascript developers who can do that stuff well are very expensive compared to c-sharp developers who you know again it's, it's a more limited programming environment in many ways but for enterprise applications i think that's going to be kind of a sweet spot so We'll see. I, I don't know how much straight JavaScript framework work we'll be um, seeing in the enterprise for long. Now, I'm not saying all frameworks are moving away from or are, are going to be unused. I just think there's going to be a subset of software development that is going to find this a very compelling uh, sweet spot. Now, interestingly, also from the .NET world, um, there's something called the UNO platform. And the UNO platform is really quite striking. I've been following cross-platform user interfaces for decades. And historically, they've all sucked. Um, you're either catering to a lowest common denominator approach, or it's just archaic or just you know hard to get stuff around. They have pixel-perfect replication across an amazing collection of platforms, you know, Android phones, iPhones, desktop applications, and now in the browser because of WebAssembly. Again, it's an implementation detail. You're not writing WebAssembly code, but you are doing things like saying, um, you know, let's take some code, express it in XAML, <coughs> and these snippets that allow us to build, um, you know, Canvas-based things or user interface elements and components, you'll have pixel perfect replication across all of your platforms. And it's no longer a least common denominator um, approach anymore. So you can really build something that will look the same and behave the same uh, across a very wide range of environments 
um, already using this this platform from a user interface perspective. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a accident that both of those are coming out of the um, .NET space, but um, it's kind of interesting. Then there's the use case of emulation environments. Um, the I'm going to open this up in Chrome only because Chrome supports uh, shared buffer arrays by default. Um, and I don't think Firefox still does, does yet. And that's for security reasons. But that's just a demo thing that has nothing to do with WebAssembly. This is a runtime environment. Uh, it's got a very thin, light REPL kind of capability, but it's WAPM aware. So we have a certain number of projects installed already, like CowSA. So I can CowSA um, assembly is pretty neat. And it's got the capabilities to then take the CowSA application and run it. You can say WAPM install QR2Text. And it will pull from the WAPM infrastructure that I showed you earlier um, a text environment or a, a, a the ability to generate QR codes. So I have a QR or a URL for myself um, for stable URI kinds of reasons, and I'm now able to then just generate a QR code. So if you took that and zoomed in on it you'd be uh, re redirected to a document that talks about me uh, in, in RDF. So having this environment you know, like running as a shell um, in, in the browser is pretty wild. And it even allows you to have URLs that say, by the way, open up WebAssembly.shell and install these packages. And so that's, that's where the, the Docker world starts to become even less interesting because that runs here in the browser. You know. Things like Kubernetes and, and Docker are still very useful in big, high cluster environments, but we're talking about environments that we want to run on phones and watches and sensors, and ain't nobody going to be running Kubernetes in any of those environments, right? At least not in its, its sort of bigger form. But you probably also have seen this. which is a Debian Linux um, distribution running in the browser. Cross-platform, it's legit, right? I can say Python 3, examples, Python 3, Fibonacci, and it's going to then do Fibonacci calculations in Python. And then their little instructions say, you know, compile some C code and do some other stuff as well. So, I mean, that is literally Linux running in um, in uh, the browser. So as emulation environments, so, so supporting old platform games or runtimes, we suddenly have the ability to take legacy code and just simply run it in the browser without having to change it. So again, if, you're, if your issue is legacy modernization, we've got one set of approaches here. If your issue is I can't, you know, modernize this, I don't I don't want to pay to to modernize this particular tool, I still have the ability to run an environment that allows me to run it in the browser as well, right? So we've got a lot of options in terms of how how do we employ, uh, employ these capabilities. Then there's the idea of decentralized systems, right? And here um the Ethereum virtual machine um, was originally a custom virtual machine that had to run on a bunch of different platforms. And once WebAssembly came out, they're like, oh, well, that's stupid. We don't need to do that anymore. And a so a subset of WebAssembly is the engine for this new version of, of the, the virtual machine. Um, so they don't have to maintain it. They can rely on the uh, support of the environments or other environments. Um, like Wasm Edge has been used as the engine for interacting with like the, the Polkadot network um, and some other things. Um, and suddenly we can have arbitrary languages be our 
contract languages. We don't have to rely on just a solidity or something like that, um, which is kind of compelling. But there's a whole nother side of decentralization uh, around things like IPFS. And so this is a HTTPS gateway to the interplanetary file system, which is a decentralized uh, storage system. And I'm going to click on this link, and it's going to open up a web application that I wrote from the, the book, which took some pre-existing C++ code to generate Windows bitmap images. I compiled it to WebAssembly. It runs in the browser. I just loaded it to say, you know, hey, go ahead and render it. So this just rendered in the browser a Windows bitmap, which wind, uh, browsers don't support. So I've got some JavaScript code to then take the output from the file system, except browsers don't support file systems. So the application wrote to an abstraction of the file system in local storage that I'm reading out through a file system abstraction to then render in JavaScript on a canvas. And again, the pieces just really start combining in interesting ways. So this is an HTTPS TLS terminated HTTP gateway to IPFS. I can publish web applications to IPFS so that you can pull them out by identifier or DNS name if you want to, if you want to update the, the record. That becomes a directory, which in this case combines HTML, JavaScript, C, C, uh, CSS, and WebAssembly modules that will run in your browser, but there is no hosting costs. That is being served out of the same machine that I'm showing you this um, presentation on. So I have an IPFS node that's serving this content up locally, but it's being fronted by IPFS.io. Well, what if IPFS IO starts getting blocked by somebody? Well, okay, Cloudflare also fronts it. That's gonna be a much different scenario for them to, to uh, block Cloudflare. In fact, I was on a plane once, on a United plane, flying to a conference to talk about decentralized technologies, and they were blocking IPFS IO, but they weren't blocking Cloudflare. So I was able to uh, run my demos on the plane uh, as I was preparing for giving the talk there. So this idea that we now can publish safe, fast, portable code using whatever languages we want, not have to have a hosting environment. There's no Amazon hosting going on here. This is my local Mac mini serving up to a network of nodes that you can have multiple copies of around for caching purposes and whatnot, serving this up to whoever asks for it. So if any of you want to run this, you should be able to click on it. Once it loads, push the load button just once. It's not it's not very well optimized. I don't use any threads or anything. So it's very easy to to like actually hit it twice because it takes too long. But you should see the same thing. And I'm guessing some of you are on Windows, some of you are on Linux, some of you are on Mac OS. And that combination of decentralization with safe, fast, portable code that doesn't need to be hosted. I have a very big vision for Web3 that's well beyond just cryptocurrencies. They've they've tried to claim the term recently, but Web3 is going to kick Web2's ass and it's already starting to happen. So we've got the ability to publish arbitrary code, run it everywhere, serve it up in these environments. And that gets us down to this, this really exciting new um, space that's, that's emerging as well called cloud and edge computing environments. So you may not be familiar with the concept of edge computing, but the idea is running stuff in the cloud all the time doesn't make any sense. As It makes no more sense than running nothing in the cloud all the time. I think one of the core aspects of being a successful IT person moving forward is paying only what you need to to get an answer. And that means to minimize the cost of computation. And that's minimize it from a clock time perspective, a money time perspective, 
a latency time perspective and um, a power perspective. And so now having the ability to push our code where it makes sense to do so is, is going to be a key part of that. So we're going to need this portability, but because of you know security, we're going to need the ability to put sandboxes around all this stuff as well. And we do not want to write feature-tested code that's looking in all these different environments. So we're seeing the emergence of, hey, I want to do training in the cloud, but then I want to push uh, the model down to the device. I want to deploy to the edge of the region of the cloud provider or push it into um, you know, the edge of your wireless service provider. Put it on the boundary of on-prem and off-prem or put it in-prem, in-browser, on-device. We have the ability, we have this continuum of capabilities to do so. So we're seeing environments like Fastly come out. So this is using a kind of a toy IDE called um, WebAssembly Studio. I can say, create a new project to do image processing and populate it with a bunch of C code. This is going to create um, uh, an environment um, with the files and everything uh, there. But I can come down here and look, right? It's just regular C code. I can build and deploy it. This is now going to take the code, compile it, and push it to uh, one of Fastly's edge computing environments. Uh, and the reason they're comfortable doing that, taking arbitrary C code from some idiot you know, on, on the internet is because it runs in a sandboxed environment. So again, being able to take code and push it into these environments um, and solve the cost, the various cost problems is where I think we're really seeing some exciting stuff. So again, you should all be able to go to this, but if you open up that, that link, oops, You can get to the published web page and say, let's apply some image sharpening to the cat image. And again, it's running in a multi-tenant client edge computing environment. Um, so that is pretty cool. Now, uh, like I said, there's lots of companies that are, are moving in this direction. Uh, Second State has created an environment called Wasm Edge that has had some really, really cool um, project, like I said, as an engine for working with Polkadot um, and a variety of other approaches. They're doing some really amazing things with uh, pushing AI machine learning kinds of capabilities to the, bra uh, to, to the cloud and edge. So you could take code, you could compile it, push it with like HTTP posts. So there's no elaborate DevOps kind of overhead. Um, they've got, um, measurements that show that their startup times are 100 times faster than contain uh, Linux containers in general, um, much faster uh, run times. So now you start to see the intersection of these kinds of environments and serverless architectures and microservices architectures as being very compatible. So, you know, two more Avengers, edge computing environments um, and architecture as, as a as a part of the solution. Um, and again, really amazing things are happening. Um, so they've got, uh, again, like these extensions for uh, WASI-like extensions. Um, if, if you're interested, Tim uh, is is from, from uh, the WASM Edge project. Um, you could contact him afterwards to, to get a bit more details about it. But a lot of these are being offered up as things that the, the environment, the community can use. Um, so WASI-like environments for opening up network so work sockets in a controlled way from WebAssembly environments, uh, async processing, doing TensorFlow-based inferencing, storing key value pairs. And then something that uh, a couple of the environments are now starting to add, the ability to put gas meters on the cost of computation. And so the idea here is just like with Ethereum, to avoid people taking over your computer and then you're not getting compensated for stuff running in that environment, you can start to meter how much code, how much runtime is being used 
um, and then pay accordingly. So again, when I say minimizing the cost of computation, you're going to need the ability to measure the cost of computation at a very fine level of granularity. Those are starting to come into these environments as, as well. Um, Tim just posted his contact uh, in, in the cloud, so feel free to, to reach out to them there if you have questions. They've got a bunch of really cool demos. Um, I've the, the book is, they're moving things around. Here we go. Here's the, the book to find out more details um, on the, the Wasm Edge environment. But they've got a lot of really cool uh, success stories. They are um, a Cloud Native Foundation, um, I don't know the exact term, uh, one of the one of the uh, supported projects, um, and they've just re recently started doing some integrations with Open Yurt as well. So to have Kubernetes like capabilities in a wider variety of capabilities with a very low overhead, fast startup time, computational pluggable environment. Again, you see the the synergies be between these these various um, use cases. There are other ones. Uh, Fermion is uh, a new one that's emerged recently, and they're doing some wild stuff. Um, they've got a web publishing framework called Bartholomew. It's like a CMS-based system. It's leveraging a CGI-like capability. I know that probably just sent shiver up your spine, but it's it's a way of having um, microservices and web apps in a controlled lightweight hosted way um, published by the Deus Labs group who also did Crustlet, uh, which is another WebAssembly Kubernetes interaction point. So their web page is now hosted in one of these environments, right? They, they have a self-hosting uh, environment um, and you can do this yourself. You can host it yourself. Most of the projects are available. Um, their next big um, release, I think, is in March, they said. And that's going to be a way that allows you to bring multiple storage containers together or storage pieces together. Like, I need some images and some data and some other stuff. But packaging it up in the same way we package up, like, code dependencies. Um, and then tying that all together here as well. So, like, images and sound files and things that you might want to deploy in a WebAssembly hosted cloud environment um, is that's emerging as as a, a pretty wild story there as well. Suborbital, um, a company out of uh, Canada, I think most of them are in Canada, um, is emerging as a way of again tying together various software assets, um, you know, communication mechanisms, message based, event based. Um, orchestration, you know, they've, they've got this um, Atmo runtime that um, has you know, mesh communication, scheduled jobs, a declarative programming model. So we're really seeing uh, a lot of um, companies and, and projects emerging to take advantage of these technologies in ways that make sense. So when Kubernetes is a benefit to the orchestration process in a multi-clustered cloud environment, um, it can, it, we can rely on it, but you also have the ability to then cluster things in small, small ways as well. Um, and then finally, uh, another one that's getting some traction. And, and again, most of these are uh, Cloud Native Foundation um, supported projects. Wasm Cloud um, is another system. Their, their spin on things is mostly to do with uh, actor models and capability providers and permission capability providers um, handling a lot of the asynchronous communication um, for you. Your actors aren't encumbered by being aware of their synchronization models. So the same code can be deployed in a wide variety of, of ways. Um, but I just want to end here with this image, which I think is quite quite compelling and it, it applies to most of these uh, projects and, and companies that I mentioned, which is how we're moving up the stack. We're getting more for free by our runtime environments where we used to have to buy and set them up and network them and pay for the electricity. Then we started to have 
virtual images as a way of isolating the computer and getting some time slicing out of the environments to containerization systems that were lightweight, lower overhead virtualization strategies to a WebAssembly-based environment where you could write your applications and get portability at the intersection of WebAssembly and WASI to things like you now have actors that can be deployed in these environments. And you can scale them up as needed. Um, they get attached to capability providers. So you can swap out backend key value pair implementations, kind of like uh, what Wasm Edge was doing with the um, the WASI-like interfaces that they had. So you could you could have something like a Redis or a you know key value based backend plugged in to provide the capabilities so that you have the flexibility architecturally of, of moving those things around, but you also have permission models around these things to say you don't get to talk to these things unless uh, I give you permission to, to talk to those. So this is a, a really striking image that I think uh, highlights a lot of what's going on in our industry. And as you can see, WebAssembly and WASI are key to, I think, um, what happens at the rest of the line as it goes up that way for reasons that I talked about. Yes. Hi, Renee. Hi. Um, so this is a broad question, but you started talking a little bit about databases. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you think WebAssembly is going to change the database landscape. Like, I know that a lot of people are doing databases in the browser with SQLite. And then I've seen some people also talk about uh, database UDFs and extending mm -hmm. those with WebAssembly. But curious if there's a bigger vision that you see there. Um, yes. And it's, it's a little bit of all of this, right? Um, so to some extent, um, there's there are things like, as you said, the in-browser databases um, so that we can store things in a more structured way without having to pay the, the latency penalty all the time. But obviously, that's going to have some kind of limitations, right? Um, the the larger picture, in, in my mind, is the intersection of like linked data, knowledge graphs, and WebAssembly. So... Again, linked data knowledge graphs are another Avenger. WebAssembly is just one of the Avengers. Um, and so, for example, there's a, a project called Oxygraph, which is backed by RocksDB. So that's a C++-based engine, but they've built a high-performance and limited inferencing capability um, using RDF and Sparkle on top of that. Hmm. It runs as a standalone server, but it also compiles to WebAssembly and runs in the browser as well, oh. right? So, cool. like I said, I think it's going to be a little bit of column A and column B and column C. Yeah. But this is going to allow us as IT professionals to say, okay, well, what is the problem? Mm -hmm. The problem is I need to, you know, a little bit of latency issue and a little bit of speed, performance and portability and security. And we will be able to assemble more capabilities for more environments that are less one size fits all. Hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Tim? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a really great question. Um, it's interesting whether the data storage, like the persistence, um, is an analogy thing like, um, you know, it's like what we used to have. Because I think a lot of um, people who are migrating into this space uh, want to do integration, and so they use MySQL. So it's like, oh, can we, can we use our same database? So then that means we've got to create um, like a driver um, and we've got to compile that into WebAssembly and have, you know, like say we create a um, a Rust crate, um, the MySQL driver, and then we compile that into WebAssembly and the Rust API functions we can call in, in that wasi like thing that you were mentioning before, um, you know, like the socket functionality and things like that. We can go, oh, we can do MySQL too. Or should it be just a complete paradigm shift where it's not like anything we had before, it's some new thing? Um, that's just better in every way. It's different. <laughs> it's yeah. a it's a tricky one to navigate. It's, do we do we try and sort of please the status quo, or do we just actually create something completely bonkers that's new? And, and at the same time, with some like the linked data stuff, there are open source tools like uh, D2RQ that allow you to use R2RML, which is a natural mapping between relational databases and graph databases uh, that you can like leave the data in the in the SQL database, front it with this interface, and then make it available as well. So again, we're going to have lots of different choices depending on, on... And that's where 
again, moving away from particular data structured storage systems into resource abstractions that separate the identity of the information from how it's stored and how it's serialized, but relying on standards is, I think, going to be a requirement to integrate things from key value stores, table stores, graph stores. You need a, a data model that allows you to accumulate uh, details from different structures. Yeah, that's a good point. That's like the open container initiative. You know, there's a standard, so yep. you can adhere to that standard and now you can play. That That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Awesome. All right. The final one, final use case, and then we'll see if there are any more questions and then I'll, I'll let you go, um, is mediating hardware differences, right? Um, and, and hardware, custom hardware or specialized hardware or hardware as a differentiating engine um, is another one of my Avengers. Um, because we've got CPUs, which are general purpose and flexible, but complex and power hungry. Or we have ASICs that represent, um, you know, uh, they only do one thing and they do it really well and they do it really fast and, and very low power consumption but you obviously can't do arbitrary things on there. Or you've got field programmable gate arrays, which are somewhere in the middle, um, where you can write a program to hardware and um, tie these things together. And that's a, that's another place where I think the intersection of like WebAssembly and LLVM um, are very compelling. These are different, uh, they, they mediate the differences between different architectures. So why was Apple's transition to ARM so easy? Well, they hired Christian Latner to run their tool chain, you know, and moved away from GCC to Clang. And that gave them the ability to tackle Swift. That gave them the ability to have pluggable backends to target x86 or ARM. Well, ARM was just about to be bought by NVIDIA, but that's off. And in part because there's this new kid on the block called RISC-V, which is an open source ISA that has no licensing attached to it. And um, Intel just invested heavily in them. So we're going to see more and more and more hardware differentiation. And we're going to see things like the M1s that have multiple cores, but not only that, but multiple differentiated cores that are tuned for either um, power consumption or speed. And our code is going to have to be able to run on any of these environments. So we're going to need the ability to target um, heterogeneous um, architectures as well. And by the way, nobody trusts anybody anymore. And so there's another concept that's emerging called IT sovereignty. And there's the European Processor Initiative. India and China are both in, um, embracing RISC-V as a way of sort of gaining some some independence from from Western technologies um, and and be able to have their own electronics infrastructure manufacturing capabilities. And we're going to end up with lots of little chips that are, you know, off a little bit from each other. But that's, again, having something like WebAssembly and um, LLVM is going to make such a huge difference. So with that, I will stop rambling, uh, see if there are any questions. Um, and go from there. Oh, Brian, great talk. Excellent talk. Um, yeah, if there are other questions, people want to jump in, you can raise your hand or just turn your camera on and dive in. Hey, Brian, wonderful talk. Truly enjoyed it. Thank you. I have to run to, to dinner and the toddlers downstairs, so I got to run, but uh, thank you. Sure. Hey, hey, Brian, one question. Sure. Uh, so about the language support, you know, you talked about, um, I mean, okay, CC++, Rust, you know, non-GC languages, but uh, I know there is a proposal for GC WebAssembly, but until that is there, how these languages are managing it by putting their own runtime or something? Yeah, so again, there's there are, uh, the WebVM Linux environment uses a technology, uh, compiler technology called Chirp, for J, uh, Chirp J uh, and Chirp, um, that allows you to compile using, um, I believe, LLVM, at least in part, behind the scenes, to a JavaScript and WebAssembly-based environment. And a lot of those things are like emulating garbage collection or you know, uh, even like the Rust, there's like different allocators um, around these things. 
so they're they're kind of hand doing it themselves for the time being um but the garbage collection implementations are moving forward the threading implementations are moving forward so i think it's it's really just kind of a, a matter of time i don't think it's gonna be long before erlang and elixir and java and and these sorts of things will will be first first um well supported languages but we're also seeing the emergence of you know grain and zig and and things like that as uh grain is a web assembly native language designed to bring academic language advancements um out quicker because they can do it in a cross-platform and um portable way thanks mm -hmm. hey brian um can you give a quick overview of the virtual machine that's at the heart of the specification is it is it a traditional von neumann like it's a it's, it's a stack machine um and it only supports numbers so uh for example to add two numbers together which is sort of what we call WebAssembly hello world <laughs> um you have a function the function takes two parameters there's an instruction to load one of the parameters to the stack machine they get pushed to the stack then there's an instruction to say like add two 32-bit integers. It'll pop those off and um, add them together, and then push the result to the stack machine. So what's left on the stack machine is the result of the function. So that's so, a little bit like reverse Polish notation. Kind of, kind of. Um, but there are also then instructions to load stuff to and from memory, and so you can start to emulate strings and things like that um, with with that. Um, and then there are emerging protocols or uh, proposals like the, uh, interface types and whatnot to allow us to have cross-platform dictionaries and lists and arrays and things like that at a higher level, uh, that can be very easily lowered to a particular language runtime or instruction set. Um, and yet still allow us to sort of express things more sanely than trying to think about like utf strings as numbers in linear memory um but at, at its core it's a very simple stack based instruction set and, and it's a, a reduced instruction set so very so. reduced yeah yeah um it sounds a little bit similar back in the day there were these devices called transputers yeah yeah uh they didn't have registers all the all the register things that you would consider registers would live on that stack. Yep. And and that's, again, this isn't really intended as your runtime environment. It's just way, a way of expressing arbitrary functionality. That arbitrary functionality gets translated to the particular instructions and registers that your your architecture has available to it. And that's why we, we kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, and it, is this something that's in, uh, is it pretty rigid or is it in, development will it migrate to it it will it will expand um so as an example um the the runtime initially only supported one return value per function um but they eventually added support for a multi return multi-value return uh so for things like python tuples or even um you know rust uh optional uh responses or things that have you know, like floating points um precision answers and um, uh, the like the, the Mentissa and everything, right? Um, so the multi-value return type was a proposal to extend the platform. And basically they just added a couple of more instructions and then relaxed some things such that the what was left on the stack could be one thing or two things or multiple things. And uh, so this virtual machine has some sort of mapping to the bare metal hardware, whatever, wherever it's running. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's not defined by the platform. Um, the semantics are defined by the platform. Um, the runtimes are able to do whatever they need to do. So mapping it to V8 or x86 or ARM or whatever is is, is going to be done by whatever runtime you're using. So that would be the layer where if you had some. Uh, special hardware that you wanted to take advantage of you do it at that yep scratch familiar web web assembly is there there's a proposal for simd parallelization so things like um the amd avx 512 instruction set and things like that um will be expressible and then you could 
um, map them to either serial instructions or parallel instructions, depending on the, the hardware that's available to you. Sounds fascinating. I'll have to wait and see what happens with uh, quantum computers. They seem to be smoke and mirrors mostly, but they're moving forward. I'm starting to see where there's people making money off of quantum key exchange by using uh, very, very simplistic quantum computers, but uh, it is moving forward. Yeah. So, and IBM's uh, latest offering is basically a, a chip. Mm hmm you got to cool it down to a few degrees above Kelvin, but that's a minor detail, right? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's not, it's not a huge apparatus at the moment. So we'll see. Yep. Great talk. Thanks, man. Thank you. Speaking of specification, um, I had a question if you're familiar with the GC proposal that's been going through, uh, uh -huh. the garbage collection proposal, and if you had any thoughts on it. Um, I I have not read it in detail. I've just kind of skimmed it. So I I and, and I haven't been following it recently. Um, I think some things have happened in the last uh, couple months. Um, there's some shifting happening in in the platform space, like what how they're imagining the relationship between Wazi and the platform and and runtimes. Uh, so I, I'm I'm going to hold off answering that question just. Just because uh, I don't know kind of what the current thinking is, um, but I know that there are implementations uh, in a proof of concepts, and um, I don't think you know once they decide what they want to do, I don't think there's going to be a lot to to slow them down um, to actually bringing it to 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 bear. Cool. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's great. Does anybody else have any questions? Well. Uh, great. Well, Brian, yeah, once again, thank you so much. That was an excellent talk. Sure. Um, and uh, for everyone else, thank you so much for coming to our first meeting. Uh, we will have the recording uh, up on YouTube. And I will also uh, keep track of all these comments here with the links and resources and have those on the meetup page. So um, um, I guess that's it. And uh, feel free to sign off or feel free to stick around if you have any other uh, questions or just want to chat. So. Yeah, thanks so much. Right. And I will just kind of stick around while people find their way sure. out. Sure. Um, I did, you know, now that I said that, I did realize I had one other question. Um, maybe maybe people can, as they're leaving. Uh, you, you did mention the JVM a couple of times and how mm -hmm. this is like the realized 30-year matured version. Um, I found that every time I kind of bring up what I find exciting about WebAssembly, someone, you know, says, you know, like it's been tried and and it didn't work out, right? <laughs> and um, I kind of feel like it's a it's it's an unfair criticism because the context has changed. Yeah, the context has changed, the business context has changed, the technical context yeah. has, has changed. Um and I would just say, you know, even with just the demos that I showed you, yeah show me anything in history that has been able to work as well as what I've shown you tonight. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the answer is, I don't, I don't think you can. I mean, I mean, Java did some amazing stuff, but not in the browser and not in embedded devices and not in, you know, cloud computing environments and not at this performance. And, you know, so I, I think what's different is they're not over specifying the platform. I think they're, they, they have built something that has degrees of freedom and that degrees of freedom make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that <laughs> brings up another uh, thing about possibly one of the reasons Java didn't do so well is every time they release something, it was incompatible with the previous version. Is there any safeguards in the WebAssembly area to make sure that things move forward without breaking what's already happened. Um, I mean, you, you know what I mean? There's, there's, yeah, there's nothing intrinsic in it, um, but they are very aware of that and that they're, they're you know, they, they're not unwilling to, to change and break things, but they only do so if it makes sense to. And, and usually they try to find ways of extending the platform without doing that. Um, but 
I, I don't think there's anything intrinsic about it. Uh, to the extent that it, it's trying not to do everything, it's not trying to solve like all your networking problems and your security problems and your UI problems. I think it's easier for it to avoid some of that. Um, but I don't think there's anything intrinsic to to the uh, implementation for that. Yeah, because I mean, it was like how many how many people have run into when Java was involved with the web more. You'd go like you'd go to some corporate website and it was like, sorry, you need this version of Java. Yeah, I've got the latest and greatest. Why doesn't it work? So I think I think to, to that extent, that's one of the reasons Wazi is going to make a difference is because okay. Wazi is more of an interface, um, and it's a loosely coupled interface. Whereas you know, if you need to provide an implementation of something um, in a an environment, you could like backfill it with polyfills, um, and that would that would that, you you couldn't extend the JVM like that. Um, and therefore, you know, you would need to move to JDK three or five or nine or whatever. So well, I think I, I think that's probably the extent to which the platform is uh, more resilient to to some changes that way. So. Awesome. Although I suppose you know, I mean, I can imagine the same problem at Java. You needed oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Java. That will happen. Like you know, so for example, if you uh, right now Wasm sixty four is going to come sooner or later. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know there will be time when it's like, oh, you need Wasm 64 and time. If you don't have it, that will happen. Wasi 2.0 will be there down the line somewhere. So that's, I guess, you know, it's just a, just to be expected. That is yeah. 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 No, I, I, that's what I said. I don't think that it solves the problem, but I think it's got some degrees yeah. of freedom to make it less of a problem. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you basically again sort of like essentially becomes a capability model, extension of capability, effectively, yep. in a, because you, you need certain capability, and if you don't have them, then you have to ask for those or upgrade or whatever. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's one thing if you're if you're making drastic changes because it's really making the world better. That's one thing, but like with with the Java stuff, it's like every sub point release was something you had to pay attention to because yeah. like the previous one wouldn't work or the, it, the next one won't work. So the other uh, thing I would say is th this also isn't a um, benevolent dictator kind of situation in that there are, you know, there's Wasmer and Wasm Time and Wasm Edge and, you know, there's uh, Wasm 3, right? There are, and Wasm R and there's a lot of different runtimes. Um, I think it'll be easier to find... Um, a runtime that provides you the stable version that you need, right? Uh, because it's not just one person or one organization trying to push you along. Yeah. So I think there are going to be two worlds, right? You know, one is browser world, uh, which will will have its own essential. But nowadays, browsers are keeping up very fast with respect mm -hmm. to whatever new thing comes. I mean, in Java, one of the reasons, one of the thing that did not work in Java's favor was browsers were not we're not willing to basically go to Java. Essentially, right. we wanted to stay with whatever they want. But that's it. Seems a little bit different in WebAssembly, where browsers are keeping up with whatever latest is going on. So it's less likely to be fragmented. Just just the way I think things have become a non-technical, essentially uh, aspect of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, anybody else with the five of us that are left? I need to jump off. So once again, thanks, yeah. Brian. Sure. Just, yeah. I, I don't. I hope you can know that it. I appreciate being able to speak with somebody like you. I mean, how often do you get to talk to the author of a of a book? So absolutely, it's a great great platform. Thanks, guys. We'll sure. see you next time. Thanks All for right, coming by, Ron. Appreciate it. Take care. Cool. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Right. Thanks Rob so much. Us, just reach out. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do that. All right. See ya. Bye.